Hello. Welcome to the 2021 Next Gen Awards celebration. My name is Chris Punongbine, and I'm going to be the host uh, for today. I just wanted to say thank you all for being so early. I see so many of you leaving uh, comments and just identifying yourselves. If you haven't done so yet, please let us know who you are and where you're coming in from. Uh, if you're connected to change lawyers, your preferred gender pronouns. I see so many of our scholars are already here. Board members, Judge Robinson from Orange County, great to see you, or great that you're here to join us. Um, Uncommon Law, our partners uh, from Oakland, California. It's really just a great get together. And of course, we can't be together in person, so we'll do the best we can with this virtual celebration. So I'd like to hand things off now to my amazing board president, Jeannie Fugate from Los Angeles. Good afternoon to you all and welcome to the 2021 Next Gen Awards for California Change Lawyers. Uh, my name is Jeannie Fugate and I have had the absolute privilege of serving on the Board of Change Lawyers for the past eight years. I'm currently the board president and I'm very excited to welcome you today to celebrate the great accomplishments of this very important organization to our California legal community. Change Lawyers is committed to a better justice system for all Californians and empowering the next generation of legal change makers. Before we get started, I would like to start off by thanking all of our sponsors. Our incredible scholarship sponsors will be recognized later in the program. For now, I'd like to recognize our 2021 event sponsors without whom today would not be possible. First of all, our champion sponsor is the Walt Disney Company. I'd like to thank our advocate sponsors, which are Sussman Godfrey LLP and Access Lex. I'd like to thank our supporter sponsors, who are ABA Retirement Funds, Alan Matkins, the Golden State Warriors, Heritage Bank of Commerce, and the Singh Aluala Immigration Law Firm. I'd like to thank our ally sponsors, including Baker McKinsey, Collins Kim, the San Francisco Foundation, and the Valence Law Group. And finally, I'd like to thank our community sponsor, Calbar Affinity. Finally, I would like to thank all of the Change Lawyers staff, board, and 2021 Next Gen Awards host committee for doing all of their parts to make this event possible. And with that, I will turn it back to Chris. Thank you so much, Sheeny. I am so thrilled today to present our first award, which is the Law Firm of the Year Award. Our honoree is Wilmer Hale. Wilmore Hale is a leader in the legal community because of their commitment to equal justice. For years now, the firm has demonstrated that commitment by supporting the core work of change lawyers in empowering the next generation of legal change makers, particularly our 1L scholarship program. This year, they are supporting a record eight 1L scholarships for law students from across California. What is unique about Wilmer Hale is how their generosity is expressed in all parts of the firm. They have provided pro bono counsel to change lawyers. And not only does the firm itself support our scholarships through charitable contributions, but so do numerous individual attorneys from throughout the firm's offices and not just in California, but across the entire country. This award is being accepted by Mark Selwyn, co-chair of the Intellectual Property Litigation Practice Group from the Palo Alto office of Wilmer Hale. A board member since 2016, Mark is currently the co-vice president of Change Lawyers, and he himself is an amazing uh, advocate, advisor, and champion for justice, diversity, and inclusion. Congratulations, Mark. Thanks very much, Chris. On behalf of Wilmer Hale, I wanna thank California Change Lawyers for the honor of this award. We're so proud of our longstanding relationship with Change Lawyers, and even more proud to support Change Lawyers in its critical mission, building a better justice system for all Californians. At Wilmer Hale, we share Change Lawyers' belief that it's crucial to support recruitment, professional development, and advancement of lawyers from communities that have historically been and remain underrepresented in the legal profession. And we join with change lawyers in our commitment to a fairer and more equitable system for all. We recognize that a broad range of experience expand our perspectives and improve both our lawyering and our workplace. 
I want to especially congratulate all our Change Lawyer scholars for their amazing achievement, tenacity, and vision. You are the future. We need bright, courageous, resilient leaders like yourselves to effectuate change, to accelerate the pace towards equality and inclusion, and to help lift barriers that still exist in so many places to access to justice. The last several years have highlighted, often tragically, that we have much work to do, but your, st your stories fill us with confidence that it can be done. Thank you again. And I just wanted to break in to say, Mark, thank you so much to you and your firm. And thank you also for that amazing speech to get us started. I think it's precisely a, a good, great way to start. So thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Our next award today is for the Change Lawyers Alumni of the Year. San Francisco Supervisor Hillary Ronan. Supervisor Ronan exemplifies the potential that all of our 1300 alumni hold to become legal change makers. You heard that we have over 1300 alumni, people who have received Change Lawyers scholarships over the past 31 years, Change Lawyers fellowships. We have a great community that we can lean on and continue to support. The format of the section will be a fireside conversation between Supervisor Ronan and another newly minted alumni, 2021 Change Lawyers Fellow, Princess Manessa, who I am happy to introduce now. Princess is a journalist turned lawyer and was a Change Lawyers Fellow at Alotrolado, a legal service organization at the US-Mexico border serving deportees, refugees, and separated families, where she provided direct representation to asylum seekers held in immigration detention. She is a descendant of the people who built this nation under the force of slavery and is privileged to serve those who experience human rights violations akin to what her ancestors survived. Welcome, Princess. It's great to see you. Thank you so much, Chris, for having me. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Change Lawyers alumni, San Francisco Supervisor Hillary Ronan. Hillary was elected to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors in November 2016, representing District 9, the Mission, Bernal Heights, and Portola neighborhoods. As supervisor, one of her signature accomplishments was passing Mental Health SF, groundbreaking legislation to ensure universal access to coordinated mental health care and substance use treatment and working with the community to get more than 1300 units of affordable housing underway. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Supervisor Ronan has fought for city resources for the most underserved communities, including creating the Right to Recover program to ensure that anyone who tests positive for COVID-19 has the financial means to take care of their basic needs as they recover. She is the only Spanish speaking member on the Board of Supervisors. And before she became an elected official, which is how I got to know the supervisor, she was an attorney focused on workers' rights and immigration law at the San, Fr San Francisco nonprofit organization, La Raza Centro Legal. And then way back in 2002, <laughs> Supervisor Ronan received a scholarship from Change Lawyers and we are so proud of how far she's come since then. Congratulations to our Change Lawyers Alumni of the Year, Supervisor Ronan. Thank you so much. And thank you for my beautiful award. <laughs> I love it. Congratulations. And Princess, I'll hand it off to you. Thanks, Chris. So great to be with you, Supervisor Ronan. Lustrous career. That was an awesome introduction. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. Well, let's get right into it. Um, after you received the California Change Lawyer Scholarship in 2002, like Chris mentioned, you started your career as a public interest attorney in the Mission District of San Francisco, correct? That's right. You fought for low-wage immigrant women workers, and then you pivoted to public service. And you were elected to the supervisor position for the District 9 that you work in now. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, San Francisco is a city and a county. So the elected officials are not city council members, they're actually supervisors. 
So did you ever imagine, Supervisor Ronan, uh, when you were in law school that you'd rise to the supervisor? No, not at all. <laughs> it was a complete career turn that I could have never anticipated and I did not set out uh, to run for office. Um, so I was a worker rights attorney working with mostly low wage immigrant workers, day laborers and domestic workers at La Raza Centro Legal. And I would file legal claims at the California State Labor Commission office for unpaid wages uh, for those workers. And we would win every case, hands down. That was never an issue, winning the case. But we rarely, rarely got justice for the workers. So winning the case did not equal justice for these this group of highly um, abused, quite frankly, workers, uh, because we rarely recovered the full wages that were owed, almost never recovered penalties. And so we had to fight so hard. The worker had to go to several hearings just to get the wages that they were owed in the first place. So it just felt incredibly frustrating to me. And you know, we must have filed hundreds and hundreds of these cases over and over, and it just felt like a band-aid that ultimately wasn't achieving the justice that we wanted to achieve. So I worked with the Women's Collective at the time of immigrant women from all over Latin America who uh, were organizing for a uh, change in their work working conditions. And so we together, the workers and myself and a group of advocates wrote the first version of the Domestic Worker Bill of Rights. Um, and we then got a sponsor in the California State Assembly, um, then Assembly Member Tom Amiano. And uh, the women themselves wrote the law with, you know, with my assistance and then went to Sacramento and fought uh, to pass the law and they did that you know they lost the first time and then they won the second time around and it was through that experience that i realized if you're really fighting uh for the most marginalized uh people and and oppressed people in our in our country sometimes the law really isn't the best vehicle it doesn't work <laughs> and actually changing the law so that it works and empowering and creating a, a forum for those those people to lead the writing and the crafting of the law that will actually serve their needs and 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 help them find justice in this case in the workplace. Um, that really it was through you know uh, the legislative route that was really powerful. And so at the time um, I, I was at La Raza Central Legal. I'd been there for close to seven years. And there was an opening uh, for a legislative aid position in my predecessor's office, the, the District 9 supervisor. And I applied and got that, that, got that job. And, and for the next six years, worked with former uh, supervisor David Campos. And we just wrote dozens of laws that had a direct material impact in the lives of the people uh, that we're all fighting for in, 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 the, in the change lawyers community. And um, and so then when super, you know, you can only serve two terms uh, four years each in in San Francisco. And so when David Campos was termed out, uh, you know, he really encouraged me to run for office, which, believe it or not, throughout the entire time I was working as a legislative aide, I still hadn't considered running myself. I don't know. You know, they often say with women, you know, you have to ask a thousand times before they're willing to run for office. I, I think that's changing with this generation, but mm -hmm. that certainly uh, rang true to me. It just, I just didn't picture myself in, in that position. And I finally, I, I finally decided, okay, I'm going to do this and ran for office and, and here I am. Wow. What a beautiful progression. What a great story. So it sounds like the switch from lawyer to legislator was just like a natural progression. But like you said, there was some resistance there with you still didn't see yourself necessarily in that role until it was just painfully obvious, like, well, you would be great at this. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Wow, that's, that's really cool. Um, let's talk about some of the work you've done with homelessness. Yeah. It's no secret that, that San Francisco is one of the most expensive cities to live in. And um, unfortunately, the rising cost of living has caused quite a social upheaval. 
with um, increased homelessness and a lack of affordable housing. You've spent many years working on these issues as well. What do you think needs to be done to create both a medium term and a long term solution in your professional opinion to the affordable housing and the lack of affordable, uh, the homelessness and the lack of affordable housing? Yes, thank you for the question. It is the the issue of our of our of our time and of our day in in San Francisco and really all over the United States, definitely all over California. Um, and I think in the medium term, what we can do, or actually maybe even the short term, is we 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 can encourage our Congress uh, to pass the Build Back Better Act. That it's the first time that there's an infrastructure bill at the federal level at, that is at the level that could make a real difference in the housing crisis that we're, we're facing in San Francisco and all over California. Um, it, it, the problem is, I say it, because we in, in San Francisco, you know, for decades have been trying to solve the homeless crisis in our city. And it's only gotten worse, not only in San Francisco, but all over California. I mean, I, I grew up in Los Angeles. Every time I go back there, I cannot believe um, how many people are sleeping on the streets. Yeah, that's right. that, yeah. Oh, so you know, and I, I and that wasn't the case when I was growing up. Um, not to this degree, and not in you know neighborhoods that people are now sleeping. Mm -hmm. And the same is true for San Francisco and for Oakland and for Berkeley. And you know, it's happening even you know in small towns in Northern California. And I, we have tried you know, a million ways of, uh, under the sun to fix this crisis. And we've made differences here and there. But we are not going to solve this until the federal government gets in the business of building housing again. Uh, I, you know, over the years, uh, the federal government has sort of put up their hands. They said public housing was a failed experience, experiment. And so we're just not going to do anything. It's basically what they've done. Cut, you know, funding to HUD year after year after year the list for Section 8 housing have been, you know, overflowing. And we just can't build at the scale of subsidized affordable housing at the scale we need to do so unless the federal government prioritizes it and funds it. And that's because localities, state and local governments, we have to balance our budget. We can't run a deficit. Uh, the federal government you know, chooses to run a deficit all the time for big corporate tax breaks and, you know, to, to launch wars all over the world. Uh, but they never decided to run a deficit to build housing for our own residents, right? And that's what we need. We need hundreds of thousands of units of housing built all over this country and it to be a true human right in, in the United States of America to, to live in a safe house. Um, you know, we have people in Sacramento uh, that are trying to make it easier for private developers to build market rate housing. And they argue that, you know, market trickle down economics will, you know, lower the cost for um, low income folks. You know, I call BS on that. It, it, it ain't going to happen. It takes a long time to trickle down. They've been saying that for a it, long time. It's not going to happen. The cost of housing is just too high and developers will only build if they if they get incredible profits out of it mm -hmm. so the second that the cost of housing goes down because they've built a lot they'll stop building we this is this is a government necessity we need to be building and subsidizing housing at the government level and we need the feds uh, to pick up this mantle. We're not going to build public housing like we built them in the past. We have new ways of doing it. We're not going to have communities that are separated from the rest of society uh, where, you know, crime and, 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 and drug use is allowed uh, to, to happen. We're going to mix subsidized housing in with regular housing. We're doing it all over San Francisco. We're doing it all over uh, the Mission District that I represent. And um, it works, it works. We have beautiful buildings filled with families that are thriving, uh, that are built by nonprofit developers. Uh, it's, a, it, it's the only model that's happening right now. It's a beautiful model, but we just can't build at the scale that we need to build to solve the crisis. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And that's awesome to see the power and the impact that legislation can have. So you said the Build Back Better Act. Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, we have these uh, this amazing cadre of mostly young women, I will say, in Congress, in the House, um, 
that are, uh, you know, my biggest hope for change in this country, um, that are are just refusing to back down. They're 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 fighting for the people of this country um, in a way that I haven't seen, you know, aside from a few people there in generations. And their caucus, the Progressive Caucus in the House, is just growing and growing and growing every term. And it's honestly what gives me most hope. Awesome. Well, let's talk a little bit about that power, that power from Congress all the way down to local government. When you practice law, you could have been characterized as like a movement lawyer. And then you worked in a nonprofit organization. You practice law in the context of movement for social change. You also practice law as a means to build community power, in particular for women and immigrants. Now you work in the halls of power and many of your constituents are women and immigrants. How are you using your platform as an elected official to continue to fight for vulnerable community members? Um, absolutely, uh, in ways small and large. So um, right now I just came from a protest in front of City Hall uh, that was organized by the immigrant rights community uh, to demand that President Biden start changing immigration policy in this country and stop continuing the racist, xenophobic, uh, laws and, and tactics of the prior administration. Um, and, you know, it, it's as simple as we got them the stairs and a podium and, and we're able to support their action. So that's the small ways that we can just, we're, we're, we're an open door. The community knows us, they know to come to us and that we'll always have their back uh, and help them in any way they need to bigger ways. So right now, one of the pieces of the legislation I'm working on that I am so excited about um, once again, is with the domestic worker, the California Domestic Worker Coalition. And this is, you know, they're running the bill. I'm just their sponsor. And we sit down with them and we work out the details. Uh, it's an amazing bill where in California, well, in California, but in San Francisco, I'm not sure if it's the law yet in California. In San Francisco, we have a sick leave law that for every 30 hours worked, workers earn one hour of paid sick leave. And, for, and domestic workers are covered by this law, but because they often work only a couple hours a week for each employer, but you know, if they're doing, let's say house cleaning, you know, they might have 20 clients in a week um, and they work a couple of hours in every household. So technically they're supposed to be accruing the sick leave, but it ends up being so minuscule with every individual client that they never actually use it. They never actually, they don't even know how, how would you record keep? How would you do that? And so we are partnering with the, with the coalition to create a law here in San Francisco that would require the city to contract with an entity that creates an online platform that allows them both employers and, you know, gig workers like domestic workers, um, you know, aggregate all their time off from all the different employers so that they have meaningful time off when they're sick or need to care for a loved one. Okay. And so um, this is a law that I'm writing. Once again, it's almost going back to my old school at La Raza Central Legal, only now I'm the legislator who's writing the law with the domestic workers. And uh, we're looking forward to introducing and passing that law later this month in, in San Francisco. Um, so those are sort of, you know, anything from, you know, something little in providing access space uh, credence, energy, press access to the community, to actually partnering with the community to write and pass uh, these important laws. Um, those are the different ways that we use the power of, of the legislator, legislature here locally in San Francisco to, to, to invite community in. Yeah, that's super exciting. Um, you know, hindsight gives a beautiful perspective. Looking back on your career now, what were the key choices that you made that led you to become the San Francisco supervisor? Great question. Um, a number uh, of choices. Um, one, and you know, I know, I can't believe how long ago it was. <laughs> I'm like, I, I'm getting older and older and older all the time. But when I went to law school, well, law school, you know, was so much cheaper than it is now. I can't believe how expensive it is now. But even back then, it was, you know, more than that I could have imagined taking on the debt. And I knew I wanted to uh, spend my life uh, fighting for a more just world. And so I um, looked for law schools 
that had really good loan assistance repayment programs. And it worked, you know, I was able, I, uh, I went to UC Berkeley School of Law, they paid back almost all of my loans. So I, I almost never, I never had to pay it, which meant that I could earn $32,000 a year. I mean, that was in 2003. So nowadays that wouldn't be enough. But back then I lived in San Francisco in studio apartment. Um, I worked as a social justice lawyer, earning very little money. And I was thriving. I, you know, I, I, and that was because of the loan assistance repayment program. I don't know how I would have done it any other way. So, you know, I, I know most of uh, the students are already in law school that are participating today. Uh, but if your law school already doesn't have a, a loan assistance repayment program, start one, make them have one because today's world and, and thank you change lawyers for the scholar you know the fellowships and scholarships that you're providing it's impossible to do justice work without financial assistance from the law school so that's number one you know find that law school that has a good loan assistance or payment program or start it at your school because uh, you're going to need it if you're working in social justice i love that advice i love that initiative like this California Change Lawyer Scholarship, like you said, and scholarships are what got me through law school. So that's awesome. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then some other little tricks, you know, when I was in law school, um, I treated it as if it was like a like a critical race theory program. You know, I took all the social justice classes. I took all the rec like the courses that you had to take to graduate, but I didn't take any traditional law school courses outside of that. And when I graduated, um, I was like, oh shoot, that would have been helpful to know corporate law and tax law and family law and all these different types of more traditional law courses because when you're working with community, um, it's actually helpful to know all those traditional <laughs> courses and laws to be able to help your community fight for their rights. And so um, if you were like me and you know social justice oriented, uh, you might think it's good to take all the clinics, which I did. I took all the clinics and, and all the critical race theories and, you know, sort of the, the social justice law law courses. But take those traditional classes, too, because you're going to need them. <laughs> you're going to need them to support. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you so much for chatting with us. It's been super inspiring to hear your story. And, and it just makes us think of all the things that we can do in our future. So thank you, Supervisor. Uh, thank you, Princess. Thank you for your all your amazing work. It sounds incredible. Thank Keep you. It up. <laughs> thank you, Supervisor Ronan. And congratulations again on your award. And thank you, Princess, for leading us through this uh, very illuminating and inspiring keynote conversation. Thank you. Good to see you all. Take care. And it is now time for our scholarship awards presentation for our 2021 uh, scholars. Here to present the awards is our very own Change Lawyers board member, Alicia Vaz. Alicia is a partner at Cox Castle in Los Angeles and is the chair of our scholarships committee. Welcome, Alicia. Hi, Chris. How are you? I am good. You have to agree with me that this is one of the most gratifying parts of the work of Change Lawyers, giving financial support to our amazing students. It is unbelievable. I mean, the scholarship financially supports rising first-year law students who are committed to practicing California and furthering diversity in the legal profession. What could be more important? They, in, for those of you who don't know, we have an extremely rigorous application process where our scholars have to demonstrate their academic uh, promise and potential, their uh, ability to serve as a future change maker, and their uh, demonstration of grit in the face of adversity. So many, many challenging um, characteristics, and these are the groups, uh, the students that have risen to the top. So we'll, um, I'll hand it over to Alicia now to read their names. And while we're waiting, <laughs> if you need to uh, do a shout out, please do so in the chat. It's great to see the conversation that's going on. If you haven't identified yourself, please do so. We'd love to know where you're coming from and who you are. And also you can see on the bottom of the screen is the opportunity to support this work at Change Lawyers. 
you can text to 44321 and type in the word change lawyers and a link will pop up and just click on that and you can make a donation to support our work. Um, it is truly a privilege to be able to go to my virtual office every day to be able to support the next generation of legal change makers. So let's try this one more time. Mara Maui Abera, USC Gould School of Law, sponsored by California Lawyers Foundation. Gladys Aparicio, Southwestern Law School, sponsored by Southern California Edison. Erica Baserto, UC Berkeley Law, sponsored by Wilson Sonsini Foundation. Graciela Castrejon, UC Berkeley Law, Uber Diversity Scholar, sponsored by Morrison and Forrester. Liliana Saros, Loyola Law School, sponsored by Kleindens PC. Victoria Chan, Golden Gate University School of Law, sponsored by Morrison and Forrester Foundation. Adriana Jacqueline Diaz Muralis, UC Hastings College of the Law, Roach Genentech Diversity Scholar, sponsored by Wilmer Hale. Jessica Demas, University of San Francisco School of Law, Apple Diversity Scholar, sponsored by Wilmer Hale. Ashvanika Dodwani, Washington University and St. Louis School of Law, sponsored by Wilmer Hale. Jack Donahue, UC Berkeley Law, Apple Diversity Scholar, sponsored by Wilmer Hale. Leslie Vanessa Estrada Flynn, Golden Gate University School of Law, sponsored by PG&E. Raquel Grande, Golden Gate University School of Law, sponsored by Wilson Sonsini Foundation. Ashley Kim, Southwestern Law School, sponsored by Lim Nexus. Rebecca LaFond, CUNY School of Law, sponsored by Reed Smith in memory of Deborah Broyles. Angelica Lee, UC Hastings College of the Law, UPS Diversity Scholar, sponsored by Morrison and Forrester. Priscelli Martinez, UCLA School of Law, sponsored by Manat, Phelps, and Phillips. Esther Mendez, Southwestern Law School, sponsored by California Lawyers Foundation. Gabriela Monico, Yale Law School, Intel Diversity Scholar, sponsored by Wilmer Hale. Gloria Nunez, UC Hastings College of the Law, sponsored by Pillsbury. Grace Obiazuike, Loyola Law School, sponsored by Oric. Stephanie Ordaz, Loyola Law School, sponsored by Kiesel Young and Logan. Maripal Pals, UC Berkeley Law, sponsored by Loeb and Loeb. Stephanie Cairo, UC Davis School of Law, sponsored by California Lawyers Foundation. Brenda Quintanilla, UC Davis School of Law, sponsored by Downey Brand. Jamal Rashid, University of San Francisco School of Law, can't, Change Can't Wait Scholar, sponsored by Stupski Foundation and California Change Lawyers. Farah Rodriguez, University of the Pacific McGeorge School of Law, sponsored by Munger Tolls and Olson. 
Cheyenne Rogers, University of Connecticut School of Law, sponsored by Wilmer Hale. AJ San Diego, UC Berkeley Law, Intel and Diversity Scholar, sponsored by Wilmer Hale. Evelyn Sanchez Gonzalez, UCLA School of Law, sponsored by Cox Castle and Nicholson. Sarah Sarvestani, USC Gould School of Law, sponsored by Morrison and Forrester Foundation. Minerva Siguenza Gomez, Seattle University School of Law, sponsored by Fenwick and West. Esmeralda Suarez, University of Michigan Law School, sponsored by Wilmer Hale. Courtney Basha Taylor, UCLA School of Law, sponsored by Manat Phelps and Phillips. Elena Sophia Chung Hee Vermeulen, UCLA School of Law, sponsored by California Lawyers Foundation. Chelsea Viola, Loyola Law School, Adventist Health Diversity Scholar, sponsored by Nossaman. Cindy Wang, USC Gould School of Law, sponsored by Kirkland and Ellis. Well, congratulations to our 36 scholars. Can I get a virtual round of applause for all of them? They are so incredible. And Chris, Thank can you. I say that 100% of them are first generation? Oh my God, that is amazing. And that just shows the change is coming in in represented by all our scholars and the great work that they'll be able to bring to the California legal community. And of course, thank you so much to all of our scholarship sponsors who made this presentation possible in the very first place. Now, normally when we're not in the pandemic, we have the chance to meet in person and have a wonderful reception where sponsors and scholars can meet and you can hear from the scholars in their own words their own story. But in lieu of that this year, we have created a video where they are able to share a little bit more about themselves. And we'll roll that clip now. I'm a law student at the Seattle University School of Law. The University of California, Berkeley. UC Hastings. UCLA School of Law. I'm attending Yale Law School. UC Davis. The University of San Francisco School of Law. University of Southern California's Gould Law School. I want to be a criminal defense lawyer. A labor rights legal advocate. I want to work directly with foster youth. I see myself being a criminal justice lawyer. An immigration lawyer. A holistic civil and human rights attorney. I really want my work to focus on folks who are part of the LGBTQ plus community who have really been targeted by both the criminal legal system and the immigration legal system. I immigrated from El Salvador when I was eight with my oldest sister. My identity truly is what drives my decision to be a lawyer. I am first generation in this country, first generation high school, college, and soon to be first generation uh, attorney. I am a black woman who grew up in a low income and immigrant household. What I saw is that there were profound disparities in healthcare and education. I saw uh, my neighbors be incarcerated or negligently shot by the police. The people that I see in the system really do resemble my family members and it just makes me want to help them more. Seeing that impact on people so close to me drives me forward because I refuse for that to be the norm. As a member of the gay community, I've experienced rampant dehumanization at the hands of my family, my peers, my school, and I remember hoping someone else would be there to save me. As a lawyer, I'm going to have the power to help others. For them to be able to see a lawyer of color, say a Latina woman like myself, who has an accent, who wasn't even born in this country, be the one representing them in the courtroom, they're gonna get a sense of safety that they wouldn't get with someone else. There's a rise in Asian hate crimes, but not enough Asian lawyers to advocate for those victims. As a first generation law student, I really want to be able to gain the legal tools I need to be able to give back to the Asian San Francisco community. When I enter a law, a law school classroom, 
most people are white. I just want to be a role model to those who come after me and assist them so that we're not the few and we're the majority. Actually working within the law, with legal workers, and with clients is really in large part what empowered me to come out, being able to be surrounded by trans femmes of color who were living their best queer lives um, following their release from, from custody made me feel liberated enough, finally leaning into my power and identifying as queer. My identity is as an indigenous mujer, a mother, the identities of not being able to understand that I am worthy of being able to make systems change for, for myself, for my community, and, and the next generation of folks. Um, that as a BIPOC mujer, then I can embrace all of my identities and still thrive. We can thrive. Together we can thrive. Collectively we can thrive. If I were to look back, it's that I've been able to help to contribute to a system that really looks at people as they are, as humans, and that we are not our worst mistakes. A world of, you know, liberation, a world where people, again, are well-resourced, where communities are abundant. It's no longer the the people who have had access to institutions like law school, where there are a lot of barriers and there's gatekeeping. Um, are the ones who are driving policy changes forward, who are driving law forward, but instead it's the people who have traditionally had less power within these hierarchical systems and that they're the ones who are actually moving forward any kind of policies that would impact communities like theirs. What does it mean to end the cycle of intergenerational trauma that is not only imposed by our history, but also by this country? And making sure that it ends with me, that the next generation is able to live a different life. And that includes, I have a five-year-old, her name's Samantha, and that includes her. 50 years from now, I really hope that I personally have at least helped hundreds, honestly, of little black girls all over America and even outside of America to become female attorneys. My name is Grace Izuoke and I am a change lawyer. 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 Oh, that's so beautiful. I love how it ends. I am a change lawyer. I have tears in my eyes. Um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I have such hope for the future with this next generation of change lawyers, Chris. These scholars are all amazing. Their stories of getting to law school and their goals for the future, while each different, are so remarkable. Um, and to the scholars, I am looking forward to all the great things you will do during law school and your legal career. Thank you for being an inspiration to me, the entire legal community, and really those future generations who look up to you. You should be proud of yourselves in this accomplishment, and we are all beyond proud of you. So congratulations to each of you. And thank you so much, Alicia, for leading our scholarships committee work to make this moment possible. Thank you. My absolute pleasure. I am still so inspired by our scholars and all of our alumni. And today you've just met one of our fellows, Princess, but she is part of a cohort of Change Lawyers Fellows that we also support every year. They work at the US-Mexico border to inside California prisons to some of the most rural and underserved parts of the state. But we need your help to keep this work going. As I mentioned earlier, you can support the work of Change Lawyers by texting the number 44321 and texting change lawyers in order to donate. Just click on the link that pops up and do what you can today to support our work. You've seen how what we do at Change Lawyers is building a better justice system for all Californians. If you believe in this work, if you believe in the promise and potential of the next generation, if you believe in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and making that real, then please donate to Change Lawyers right here and right now. 
believe me, we will put your hard earned money to work and every donation will make a difference for us. One option that you can also make is to become a monthly donor. And this is very simple, just select monthly donor. And if you can spare $10 a month, that's just two lattes at your favorite coffee place, that would make a huge difference for us. So thank you so, so much. I see the ticker rising, though I only see my name on there twice. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I am so, so happy to be able to lead this organization and take all of the stories that you've just heard and support our next generation to take them to the next level. Thank you so, so much for your support. This formally ends this portion, but you can continue to donate uh, throughout the rest of the program. And just know that our work would not be possible without your generosity. Thank you again. It is now time for the final segment of the 2021 Next Gen Awards, a keynote conversation and the 2021 Leadership Award presentation to Attorney General Rob Bonta. AG Bonta will be in conversation with our 2019 Change Lawyers Scholarship alumni, Antonio Reza, who I am pleased to introduce now. In 2012, Antonio was released from jail, newly convicted of the charge, felony second degree armed robbery and received a strike. Upon his release, Antonio was determined to not become a statistic. Instead, he took advantage of his newfound freedom as a second opportunity and decided to turn his life around. Antonio is now a 3L attending Santa Clara University School of Law. He is the first student president and an active ex an executive board member of the National Justice Impacted Bar Association. He has given a TEDx talk titled From Felonies to 4.0s and became a best-selling author on Amazon. He was recognized as Wenel of the Year from Santa Clara University School of Law and was inducted into the University of San Francisco's 30 Under 30. Welcome, Antonio. And it is now my honor to introduce the Attorney General. On April 23rd, 2021, Rob Bonta was sworn in as the 34th Attorney General of the State of California the first person of Filipino descent and the second Asian American to occupy the position. Born in Quezon City, Philippines, Attorney General Bonta's passion for justice and fairness was instilled in him by his parents who served on the front lines of the United Farm Workers and the civil rights movements. A.G. Bonta's parents lit a fire inside him to fight against injustice. And that's why he decided to become a lawyer, to help right historic wrongs and fight for people who have been harmed. He graduated with honors from Yale University and Yale Law School. And prior to his current role, A.G. Bonta was a deputy city attorney in San Francisco and also served in the state assembly. Now, as the people's attorney, he seeks accountability from those who abuse their power and harm others. In elected office, he has taken on powerful interest in advanced systemic change, pursuing corporate accountability, standing up for workers, punishing big polluters, in fighting racial injustice. He has been a national leader in the fight to transform the criminal justice system, banning private prisons and detention facilities in California, as well as pushing to eliminate cash bail in the state. For all of these accomplishments, we at Change Lawyers are proud to present you with our 2021 Leadership Award. Congratulations, Attorney General Bonta. Thank you so much, Chris, and thank you to Change Lawyers. I'm so honored um for this award and thankful for the opportunity to be here with all of you i appreciate your work your commitment to using the law to lift people up to realize more justice more fairness and a better world so that, that's always what i believe the law could do and should do and in the right hands it, it does do that so thank you for all that you do honored to be with you uh, and very uh, thankful for this kind and generous recognition thank you so much and take it away antonio all right thank you Wow, 
you know, <laughs> if you would have told me 10 years ago, hey, by the way, you're going to be sitting with the attorney general for the state of California, I'd be like, you know, I'm in jail, right? <laughs> you know, like, it's just not something that happens, you know, and I'm, I'm very thankful for this opportunity and to meet you. And that's awesome. You know, I've heard about you from many places and I've heard a lot of great things. So, you know, you are the 34th attorney general of California and the first Filipino American, you know, to ever hold this position. Did you ever imagine that you would sit in that seat and hold that position? Uh, short answer is no. I, I, I never imagined that. And, and But let me also first say it's an honor to be with you, Antonio. Thank you for um, spending time with me today. Your story is incredibly inspiring and appreciate our, our time together today. I, I never imagined it. Um, I, I went to law school uh, with a hope and a dream to help people and to lift people up and to use the law as the vehicle to do that. So I hoped for an opportunity to do that. I, I, I sought uh, ways to serve through the law. Uh, to make people's lives better, and and, and I kind of just kept my head down and, and took it one step at a time. And and this is something I still pinch myself about: the fact that I am the California Attorney General, that um, you know I have this privilege and and this honor. Uh, I'm deeply grateful for it. And the thing that I want to do most is is make every day count and use every tool uh, that it has, every bit of influence, authority, and power to help people who need help. And I see my role as the people's attorney. And, and so lifting people up, fighting against injustice is, is, is the gig. And so uh, I'm, I'm thankful for it, I, although I, I never uh, expected it. So when you said, you know, you kept your head down, one foot in front of the other, one day at a time, was there any decision that you made that you can point to or multiple decisions that you know was like, this is what I did that put me on this trajectory to be where I am today? You know, I've often said that uh, dumb luck is better than skill, and that that has worked for me in, in my career. Um, doors of opportunity open up sometimes unexpectedly. Um, there's a lot of different factors that lead to them opening up, and, and um, being prepared to walk through them when they open up is an important part of um, uh, you know of, of of moving forward and 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 securing opportunities that are consistent with. Um, you know, my values and, and, and the role that I want to have. And so that's happened for me. And, and so I'm thankful again for, for, for this opportunity. I, again, one that I never expected. I, I chose a career in public service. Uh, where I worked at the San Francisco City Attorney's Office as a deputy city attorney. I think that was a really important part of um, my professional development. I think it's the best city attorney's office in the nation. And, you know, I was there with Dennis Herrera uh, as the city attorney uh, where we, we took on um, interests that were hurting people and, and fought for everyday folks and, uh, you know, made me realize that you can uh, use the law for good and to, to shape uh, important policies and, and to help people who are being harmed. And, and so, um, you know, that was, and I was a, a trial attorney, you know, in, in court regularly arguing in front of the appellate courts, uh, closing arguments, picking juries, cross-examinations. Um, and then the next step after that was serving the California State Legislature. Uh, doing you know politics and policy, and really the attorney general's role is a mixture and a combination of those two things: uh, the practice of law combined with politics and, and policy. And so, uh, I feel like I've gotten some incredible opportunity to, to to learn and grow in my professional career. But the thing that really I, I think uh, set me on the path that I'm on, uh, whatever that path may be and wherever it will go, are my parents. And you know, my my biggest inspirations, my biggest supporters. Uh, die-hard social justice advocates to the core, and you know who who grew up in movements, who fought in movements, movements that were transformational and that helped people and, and changed society. My dad in the civil rights movement, marching in Selma. Both my parents working for the United Farm Workers of America. Uh, my mom uh, working to restore democracy in the Philippines until it was restored after a dictatorship uh, marred by human rights abuses. And, you know, I, I saw that, uh, that that became part of my DNA and who I am and what I wanted to do. I wanted to carry on that legacy uh, in whatever form that may be. So I, I think uh, my parents have a lot to do with um, where, you know, the, the fights that I've wanted to fight and um, the pursuit of justice that I've sought in my life. Nice. Now you mentioned, um, obviously you just mentioned your parents, how pivotal they were for you and the movements, which, are phenomenal. You know what I mean? I mean, those are truly great movements. And 
we would be remiss not to talk about the current movement that we are in. You know, we are still in the midst of a racial reckoning, you know, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd last year. And, you know, I feel like there's, there's a couple of movements, you know, obviously the Black Lives Matter movement is front and center as it should be. That is a serious issue that has been started for too long been underpaid for too long and I feel like it's now getting the respect that it deserves um, but one thing that I personally and again this is my own selfish portion of it is when George Floyd died I noticed that a lot of people wanted to get to know him you know who is the man behind this you know the catalyst that ended up being a movement for the world and I noticed that his record was being used against him quite frequently and it was almost to legitimize the atrocity that was thrust upon him. And I just want to know like your thoughts because I am formerly incarcerated and I know it, it deeply hurts me when I've gone 10 years without doing anything wrong, you know, and without recidivating. And then I see someone like George Floyd and he had gone five years without doing anything wrong. And yet that was roughly the first thing used against him. You know, I would just like to know broadly, you know, what are your, thoughts on that and the Black Lives Matter movement? I know those are huge questions. They're, they're very big. So uh, broad broad answers would be just, tr I, I would really appreciate. Of course, thanks Antonio for the question. Let me, let me start with uh, the issue of, uh, you know, the, the attacks on Mr. Floyd. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a, a, a part of a playbook that's been used too many times, too many places on too many people, and it's wrong. And, you know, we should not define people by their worst mistakes, um, you know, people are, are are complex and 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 full of good and sometimes mistakes. And I, you know, I believe in um, redemption, uh, in in growing, um, in learning from mistakes and, and and moving forward. I certainly believe in accountability as well. Uh, but you know, that sort of marring of someone's reputation when they were the one uh, who were who were victimized. You know, in this case, he was murdered is just not something that we can accept, uh, though we, we see it too often. So it's important to do what you've just done, Antonio, which is call it out, um, make sure uh, people focus on what's being done so it doesn't become normal because it's never normal and it's never right. Um, with respect to the, you know, the, the movement that has grown out of that moment, um, it's critical that it, we sustain it and, and fuel it with, with energy and, and fight and don't let it die. And, and, and it must lead to real transformational change. I think that that one thing that was so important about that moment is that everyone was looking at one time it seemed internationally worldwide and it led to anger and frustration that led to action and uh, it led to folks doing what i don't think we had ever seen such a, a unanimity and consensus on about in the past which is to just call out and recognize and state and say and name racism and say it exists it's been part of our histories for too long we must acknowledge it we must take steps affirmatively to deconstruct it and that looks like a lot of different things. And you know, in, in our very progressive California legislature, we 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 use uh, the, the the pain and the fuel to really move forward with some great criminal justice reforms um, that address racial injustice. In in my office, uh, you know, we created the Racial Justice Bureau to to name racial injustice in California and to take a stand against it. And so, you know, whether it be Black Lives Matter uh, or any other group that has uh, moved forward with positive change uh, to address the, the problem that's been, that was, you know, so highlighted and illuminated of, of, of racial injustice. I think it's incumbent upon us to, to not let that uh, movement uh, slow down or dissipate, but continue to fuel it, continue to have an impatience for change, an urgency, uh, you know, remember how we felt at that time and, and not let it um, you know, fall to the wayside, but let, let it continue to feel, feel change. So I appreciate Black Lives Matter and everyone who uh, moved forward uh, uh, with the pain of George Floyd's murder and tried to turn it into a society that was better, more fair, more just, more compassionate. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I'm not just saying this because we're hanging out. You know, I do really appreciate that answer. I thought it, it really hit a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of really solid points, you know, both for both of the issues that I brought up. And I did not those are not easy questions. <laughs> Those are some big ones. And I really appreciate not only your honesty and, you know, your candor about it and just how, you know, blunt you're like, this is a problem. We're now facing it. And I would like to point out that, you know, a lot of people, oh, you know, they're just, you know, don't talk about it, be about it. And one, you know, a couple of things that I learned about you was that, you know, while you were in the assembly, you were being about it. You know, you took on some of these issues and, you know, like, for example, 
We've got the tackling of issues regarding police accountability and criminal justice reform through the legislations of SB 10, which was ending cash bail and AB 1506 regarding the police use of force. You know, I think I, I commend you for that. Those are serious issues and it's about time, you know, and, and I think that that's great. It shows that you're not just talking about it, you're being about it. And I think that's what we need as a nation. And I really appreciate you doing that, you know, pushing that ball forward, pushing that progression forward. And quite frankly, I would dare to say making your parents proud because this is a movement that you are now in the forefront of, you know, and I think they'd be proud. I know I am. Um, so with, with that being said, you know, what were your goals in putting forth those two reforms? You know, what, what, what were your goals with that? Transformational change, um, fixing and mending and healing a fundamentally broken criminal justice system. Um, calling out what people have accepted for too long, but was wrong that with respect to money bail, that poor people, um, would, were being punished for being poor, that they, the jailhouse door was swinging open and closed based on how much money someone had in their pocket. And no one uh, was screaming about that. And I thought we should, and I thought we needed to uh, change that practice because, uh, while it has been with us for a long time, there's many things um that have been around for a long time that we could do without and that we would bet be better uh changing and and, and moving in a different uh, path on and i thought money bail was one of them and I, I i just couldn't stomach so many people getting hurt so often um who who didn't do um anything wrong but but be poor and were withering away in jail and losing their children or losing their home or losing their car or losing their job and the spiral of pain and hurt and harm that it created um, it was wrong and California needs to lead and do better. And I thought if we could do it in California, then others uh, could do it as well. Um, there were others who had uh, been part of this movement. We wanted to get, you know, the, the, the big dog, the big player that is California in that fight in the fight for right, uh, the right type of change. And so um, that's what I was seeking. Uh, you know, at, at its core, it's, it's seeking a more just system um, and seeking a more compassionate system. And, and frankly, a more safe system. Uh, judging someone based on the size of their wallet uh, does nothing for safety. And we propose a different approach where we actually look at public safety risk instead of um, someone's, you know, the size of, of their bank account. And I thought that was the right approach. Uh, you, you know, uh, we got the bill passed after a two-year battle. Unfortunately, it was referendized. Um, fortunately, the California Supreme Court has moved forward with the Humphrey decision, which uh, requires that the ability to pay for individuals when bail is being set is considered. So we're moving in the right direction, but there's still a lot of work to do. And my view of the criminal justice system is that some of the the, the, the faults in it, the injustices in it are, are so big um, that we, we need to swing for the fence. We need to be uh, you know, as big and bold in our proposed solutions as, it, as, as big as, uh, to match the size of the problem. And um, you know the same thing with police accountability. We're, we're at an AB 1506. We're in a crisis of trust in, uh, when it comes to law enforcement in this state. Um, uh, and when you can infuse our system with more transparency, more oversight, more accountability, then that trust uh, will grow. And uh, trust um, uh, breeds safety, and safety breeds trust. They, they they grow together. And so making sure that there is an independent uh, review and investigation of officer-involved shootings that lead to the death of uh, an unarmed, unarmed Californian uh, was very important. And, you know, one irony of the fact that as an assembly member, I authored that bill is that now as the attorney general, I'm implementing it. And it's a top priority for me to do it, to do it right, to make sure that we have fair, objective, thorough investigations, uh, that we go uh, wherever the facts and law take us and that um, there is accountability, that there is oversight, and that there is justice. Yeah, that I mean, wow. I mean, that's that's what you want, you know. That's what I want, and it's just, it's awesome, you know. Don't just talk about it; be about it. And yeah, laws are there, but are they enforced? And to see you in a position now to where you can look at the facts and you can say either a this was justified or b this was not justified, and truly either a hold accountability or b hold exoneration. You know, I I I'm in the clinical law program over at. Santa Clara, where I work with the Northern California Innocence Project. 
And, you know, so we see just how the system has failed in some instances and how we try to remedy it. And I think that it's good that someone like you is in a position of power, like the AG's office, to where you can hold accountability. And then you can also see like, ah, oh, there's not enough here or whatever the facts lead you when you apply them to the law appropriately. And, you know, with that and all this great stuff that you're doing, are there any key initiatives that you're working on in terms of adjusting criminal justice reform that we haven't touched on yet? Uh, well, we're, we're certainly focused on police accountability uh, and, and the specific investigations um, that were required by AB 1506. We're also doing other investigations of, of officer involved uh, shootings, even if they're not required by AB 1506, but, but in our opinion, justice requires it, including the, the shooting of Sean Monterosa in Vallejo. Uh, we're, we're doing another, uh, we're doing a review of the Oscar Grant um, uh, killing in Oakland. And so that's very important to make sure that there, there is, there are eyes on that there's a, a full review and, and determination of, um, of any appropriate steps to take based on the, on the facts and the law. We're also looking more broadly at pattern and practice cases, looking at the patterns and practices of law enforcement jurisdictions where they have had a history of violating the civil rights of individuals. Uh, we're doing one of those investigations right now of the LA Sheriff's Department. We did one in Bakersfield. Um, and uh, we're also in a slightly different way working with San Francisco and Vallejo to improve their practices. So more broad best practices around uh, law enforcement and making sure that uh, as efforts continue to keep our community safe, that that civil rights are, are honored and, and, and that how we do things is, uh, you know, compassionate and with appropriate due process. So uh, those are some of our focal points. We're also preparing to set up a post-conviction justice unit to look at um, uh, the potential for innocence and a wrong, wrongful conviction. Also looking at excessive sentences and making sure that uh, we take steps to reduce those sentences when appropriate and in, in the interest of justice. So, uh, you know, those are, those are two of the areas that we're uh, working on when it comes to um, uh, criminal justice reform right now. Nice. Now, in terms of, I'm going to shift gears a little bit, and we're going to get a little bit into the environment. Um, not too much, but we know that, um, well, it's not commonly known that communities of color in California, they bear some of the worst impacts of climate change. And sadly, we now have what's been coined as fire season, you know, in California. And what do you see as California's future in light of the ongoing crisis that we are facing? We're in a full-blown state of emergency when it comes to climate and climate change. Um, the climate crisis is real, it's now, and it deserves all hands on deck. And, and the Attorney General's office has quite a bit of authority, um, not just representing our clients who uh, look out for the environment uh, and, and address climate change, but also our own independent authority. And so, um, you know, it's one of those things where you, you, you can never do enough. Uh, you know, we really need to do uh, work with urgency and, uh, you know, be, be ambitious and aggressive in our steps and, uh, that we take. So I set up the, uh, expanded the Environmental Justice Bureau in our office. Uh, that is not uh, just taking on climate change, although it is taking on climate change, but it's seeing those most vulnerable communities who are hurt by climate change, who are hurt first and worst, often poor communities, often communities of color. So really looking out for those who live at the intersection of poverty and pollution and fighting for them and making sure they're treated well. Um, we are looking at uh, warehouse projects where um, they create more greenhouse gas emissions because of all the uh, vehicle trips uh, by, the, by the trucks moving goods and making sure that uh, communities, vulnerable communities and disadvantaged communities are not harmed. Uh, we launched an investigation of the uh, oil spill in Huntington Beach in Orange County um, uh, to make sure that there's accountability and oversight and, and justice is done. We require it. Uh, we're taking on Trump's uh, rollbacks uh, that uh, reduced our, our, our commitment and protection uh, of the environment and um, taking on our, our, you know, the oil industry as well through amicus briefs to make sure that, um, you know, their commitment uh, or their contribution to climate change is uh, that there's accountability for that. So, you know, you know um, and, and with wildfires, we're making sure that we're taking steps to make sure we don't build in wildfire um, uh, prone areas so that we're not putting people in harm's way when we know that there's um, a strong possibility of wildfires. So there's so many dimensions to the issue and uh, proud that my office is involved in so many different ways to 
uh, protect people from the ravages of climate change. Well, I mean, considering how much you got on your plate, I know you got a lot to do, but this is going to be shown to a bunch of lawyers who are first gen, who are people of color and, you know, from all backgrounds. So, and throughout the state this afternoon. So what parting advice, what words of wisdom that you would like to give to these first generation students, these unconventional students, these students who have made it here today to hear from someone like you and what do you have to say with them or say to them? Uh, a couple things. It, one is um, you're change makers now. You don't need to wait. Um, you don't need to await your turn. And, and really, uh, we need you to be change makers now. That that commitment that you have uh, to whatever it is that you're passionate about uh, is needed in the fight today. We need, you know, it's all hands on deck. There's so many places where we need to move the needle and, and make change that is transformative. And so I, I'd say lead with your heart. You know, do what you love. Um, it, and uh, for me, that's service and and uh, righting wrongs and taking on injustices. That, that whatever it is for you, do it. If you are um, horrified by the pandemic of gun violence, or you think we're not doing enough to address climate change, or you want to provide more fairness and justice for our immigrant communities, you want to take on racial injustice, uh, we need you in all those fights. And you can make a difference now um, as you lead with your heart. Um, and also lead with your lived experiences. Own, own who you are. Um, don't be ashamed. Um, talk about your story. Um, let your story inspire others. Um, you know, sometimes when we think about what attorneys um, are and should be, there's a certain sort of stereotype. But we are many different uh, types of attorneys from many different experiences and many different origin stories and lived experience. And every one of them counts. And everyone makes us better and stronger as a cadre of attorneys fighting for more social justice. So uh, lead with your heart. Uh, own your, your own story and lived experiences and know that you can make change today. Attorney General Bonta and Antonio, thank you so much for this incredible keynote conversation. We're so lucky to have you as the Attorney General and everything that you're doing to improve the lives of all Californians. So thank you and congratulations again. Thank you, Chris. An honor to be with you, Antonio. If I can ever be of any support, please let me know. So this concludes our 2021 Next Gen Awards celebration. Thank you all so much for joining us. We will be back in the spring to recognize our next class of Change Lawyers Scholars. So please stay tuned for more information. You can join our mailing list and learn more about what we do at Change Lawyers by going to our website, www.changelawyers.org, or you can follow us on uh, social media at Change Lawyers. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.